Hello everyone, welcome back to the Cryptid Iceberg. In part 1 we barely scratched the surface despite the video being almost 2 hours long. I made this one a little bit shorter, so please let me know if you'd like longer or shorter videos. But in the first video we only covered the first 15 cryptids, and we're still on the sky level of the iceberg, the very top of the chart. So this is going to be a long series and we have a long way to go. In case you aren't aware, this iceberg chart lists cryptids from most well known to most obscure or strange, with the top level being things like Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, and the very bottom being things like the DMT Clockwork Elves, Sleep Paralysis Demons, and beings that live inside of stars. Also, while researching this, if there are any cryptids I come across that aren't on the iceberg, I'll add them in. I'm going to continue to upload this series in between uploads of other content. This iceberg itself was created by Redditor Jimbo Seth. You can find the link to his post and the iceberg image itself in the description, along with all my sources, most of them archived. I urge you to always do your own research and always think for yourself. Thank you for watching. The Enfield Horror We're starting off with one of the weirdest cryptids. At about 9.30 on the night of April 25th, 1973, in Enfield, Illinois, Henry McDaniel came home to find his children terrified. The children saw a thing that tried to break into the house through the door, and then through the window. McDaniel noticed that the window's air conditioner had been jarred out of place by something. It was then that they all heard a scratching sound at the front door. Henry looked out and saw something, a figure that he thought might be a bear. Taking a gun and flashlight, he headed out and saw a creature within the brush. He would later describe it as having three legs, a short body, two little short arms, and two pink eyes as big as flashlights. He said that it had an almost human-like body, and it stood four and a half feet tall and was grayish colored. McDaniel fired four shots at the creature, with one shot hitting it and causing it to make a hiss, much like a wildcat's, before fleeing towards a nearby railway embankment, covering 50 feet in only three jumps. McDaniel called the police, who investigated the area and found footprints in the soft earth near the house, which were dog-like in shape, but had six toe pads. The police would say that they considered McDaniel to be, quote, rational and sober in his reporting of the incident. In a later interview, McDaniel said, If they do find it, they'll find more than one, and they won't be from this planet, I'll tell you that. In the early hours of the morning, Henry McDaniel was startled awake in the dead of night by the howling of some neighborhood dogs. McDaniel pulled himself out of bed and opened his front door. Quote, I saw something moving out on the railroad track, and there it stood. I didn't shoot at it or anything. It started on down the railroad track. It wasn't in a hurry or anything. End quote. White County Sheriff Roy Pichard Jr., was so upset by the sudden influx of press and curiosity seekers looking for the monster, as well as the hysteria that was settling in on the public, that he threatened to incarcerate McDaniel if he didn't stop, quote, inciting panic by spreading his wildly terrifying tale. Five men even came to Enfield specifically to hunt the Enfield horror. These amateur monster hunters were arrested for doing so. After their arrest, Residents of Enfield expressed fears that press coverage would lead to further monster hunters who may inadvertently shoot citizens or livestock. Prior to their arrest, the monster hunters were patrolling the area near the railroad track where the monster had been sighted when they claimed that they discovered the beast hiding in the underbrush and proceeded to open fire on it. But much like the original sighting, their bullets were futile, and the monster bolted off at a speed that the eyewitnesses claimed was far beyond anything a human would be capable of. The final eyewitness of the Enfield Horror was Rick Rainbow, the news director of radio station WWKI. Rainbow and three others claimed to have seen the gray, five-foot-tall being lurking outside an abandoned house not far from McDaniel's home. Rainbow and his crew claimed that he and his crew managed to record the scream of the monster. But unfortunately, this recording has never been posted online anywhere, so we don't have access to it. These reports were covered by the news media at the time, 
with some suggesting they may have been caused by a wild ape or escaped kangaroo or otherwise caused by mass hysteria. Interestingly, there was another sighting of a cryptid 30 years earlier and 40 miles away. This beast was known as the Mount Vernon Monster, which also had the same leaping ability as the infield horror. This leads some to believe that the two monsters are connected in some way. Some investigators have suggested that the infield monster was associated with a spate of UFO sightings that allegedly plagued the region during the same time period. Why did the infield monster disappear? From what we do know, it didn't seem to behave like an intelligent extraterrestrial, yet it too was associated with UFO encounters and then vanished and has never been seen since. What happened to the audio recording of the infield horror? Did it ever exist at all? Could something like that really be lost? The Flatwoods Monster, or Braxton County Monster. To properly explain this cryptid, I need to give you some context. A lot of this comes from the author and investigator Frank Fascino Jr., who has studied this case for over 20 years and has written multiple books on the subject. The United States of America and Soviet Russia were engaged in the Cold War. Both countries were paranoid of the other's growing arsenal of nuclear weapons. During this Cold War, the summer of 1952 saw one of the biggest waves of UFO sightings in recorded history and has since been called the Summer of Saucers. The encounter with the Flatwoods monster becomes infinitely more credible when you realize that Flatwoods is the end of the story. As I said, this took place during one of the largest UFO waves in history, and thousands of these sightings were reported to the United States Air Force Project Blue Book. On the weekends of July 19th and the 26th, UFOs began appearing over Washington, D.C. For hours, these UFOs flew through the restricted airspaces of the Capitol and the Washington National Airport. The UFOs over the Capitol can be seen on screen now. During this period, the United States Air Force felt threatened by the repeated incursions of UFOs into United States airspace, and so, an order to shoot down the UFOs was given. September 12, 1952, the United States Air Force was alerted to a mass UFO sighting along the East Coast. UFOs were seen over 10 different states. The fighter pilots had orders to follow the UFOs and give them orders to land. If the unidentified crafts refused, they were to be shot down. On this day, there were 21 hours of sustained UFO activity. Author and investigator Frank Fascino studied all of the UFO reports finding 116 locations over 10 eastern states in which UFOs were seen. Using these reports, Fascino was able to reconstruct this series of events and the flight paths of four separate UFOs which entered the eastern United States from the east and the south. One of the UFOs even changed its path, making a 45 degree turn from west to south. The United States Air Force's Project Blue Book file on the Flatwoods Monster incident blamed all of the UFO sightings on a single meteor, which is impossible. The USAF states that they were able to confirm their single meteor theory with the Akron Astronomy Group in Ohio. I reached out to the same group but got no response. I find this all very odd, especially given that there are no meteorological documents of meteors flying over the United States on this day, only Project Blue Book. September 12, 1952, 7.15 p.m. in Flatwoods, West Virginia, a group of children who were playing football witnessed the bright object cross the sky. The object flew overhead and landed on property belonging to a local farmer on the highest flat area in the region. The object made no sound when it landed. Some of the boys believed that it was a meteor while others were convinced that they witnessed a flying saucer. Jack Davis, one of the children who saw the object fly over Flatwoods and land that day, said that it didn't resemble a meteor at all. Quote, The object I saw was a craft. It had a brighter, illuminated light at the top, which was a kind of orange-red. On screen now, you can see his eyewitness sketch of the craft. On their way to investigate the landing of the object, the three boys stopped at the home of the two young Mayboys to tell their mother what they had seen. 
The maid's house was at the entrance of the farm property where the object landed. The boys explained what they had seen to Miss May. And together, Miss May, the six boys, and one of their dogs ascended the remaining quarter mile to get a close look at the object. As they came near the object, the party's dog ran away out of fear. They heard a hissing noise and smelled a noxious, sickening odor. As they approached the object, they passed a tree, and just behind it was the Braxton County monster. The being was said to be 12 feet tall. It hovered next to the tree and looked down on the witnesses with glowing round eyes through an ace of spades shaped hood. It had no arms, though most artistic depictions of the creature add arms. Freddie May, who again was a child at the time, would say in later interviews, from where you're filming right there now is where it was. Left of the tree right here. And approximately it had a limb that come out over the road. I guess a limb right here that a little better than 12 feet up to that limb. It, it was standing out in front of that, of that limb. So we figured it was about 12 foot tall or in that neighborhood from back there. I think uh, it was mechanical. It, it wasn't alive. Maybe inside the thing there could have been something uh, Miss May shined her flashlight on the creature for a brief second before the entire group ran away. When the police investigated later, they found no trace of a meteor, no impact crater, nothing. Nuclear physicist and ufologist Stanton Friedman would later investigate the case, and has been quoted as saying that flat woods would have become flattened woods if there had been a meteor impact that day. Lee Stewart, publisher of the Braxton Democrat, accompanied police and managed to coax one of the oldest boys, Gene Lemon, into returning to the site. He knew the witnesses and believed them. He has been quoted as saying, I was the first person to get to the maze house. It was sheer turmoil. Three of the boys that were there were very sick at their stomachs. All of them were wheezing and coughing. Miss May's eyes were as red as they could be. Everyone was talking at once, so I just sat and listened for a while. And as soon as I realized the whole thing had taken place on the mountain right beside the house, I started asking if I could get somebody there to direct me to the spot. Of course, the answer was an empathetic no, but after a little coaxing, I convinced the two oldest boys to go up the mountain, back with us. And so we left the house. We were armed. We had a 12 gauge automatic shotgun, a couple handguns, and two or three local people that lived right around there came by and they went with us. I've never seen people more in fright. Once they reached the top of the hill, the creature itself was gone, but they could still smell the odor on the ground. Further inquiries at the Lemon House revealed that Miss Lemon and a friend were having coffee at the time of the landing and their house shook so violently that coffee spilled over the table and they thought the house had fallen off its foundation. Their radio went off for 45 minutes and then came on by itself. At 6.30 the next morning, the local director of the Board of Education saw a flying saucer take off not far from his house and immediately reported it to the newspaper. A 21-year-old girl from Weston, West Virginia, 11 miles from the Lemon Farm, was confined in the Clarksburg Hospital for three weeks after witnessing a figure of the same description as the Flatwoods monster and emitting the same odor reported by witnesses of the initial occurrence. Her mother confirmed the girl's story and said that they had seen the monster when they were on their way to church. The day after the Braxton County monster incident, a similar being was seen 17 miles away. On September 13, 1952, George Snetoski, his wife, Edith, and their 18-month-old son were driving through the mountainous roads from Frametown, West Virginia, on their way back home to New York, when their car stalled and died abruptly on a deserted roadside. George attempted to start the car, but to no avail, when suddenly, the air around him became engulfed with a noxious, foggy mist smelling like burnt sulfur. 
It was then that a beam of deep purple light flashed across the hood of the car. They noticed that the purple light came from the forest next to the car. The putrid smell of sulfur at this point had penetrated the car's interior, with all three of them coughing and gagging, and the baby began to scream and cry. George got out of the car to investigate the source of the light. As he walked deeper into the woods, away from his family, he clearly saw a glowing object a ways into the forest. He quickly turned and headed back to the relative safety of the car. As he neared his car, George leaned against a tree to try to catch his breath, but the sulfur was still suffocating. At this point, his wife screamed, and George turned to see the Braxton County monster. The description is similar to that of the original sighting, except in this case, the monster was not wearing the upper portion of its machinery. The entire upper body of the creature was uncovered. The face was reptilian and bony. It had a bloated body with long spindly arms and two fork-like fingers. Suddenly, without any warning, the being moved towards him. George said the figure seemed to glide over the ground. George believed that the creature was chasing him, but soon it was out of sight, and simultaneously, the car came back to life. This case was documented in the United States Air Force's Project Blue Book, and the US military deployed soldiers to investigate Flatwoods. The only logical explanation is that the Flatwoods monster was merely a barn owl, and the witnesses' perceptions were warped by their fear, but this still doesn't explain all of the anomalies. I'll delve into the connections with Project Blue Book, UFO sightings over Washington, D.C., the cover-up of a United States Air Force jet fighter that disappeared chasing UFOs, on the extraterrestrial or alien or ufology iceberg. If you're interested, I suggest looking into the works of Frank Faschino Jr. I'll leave the links in the description. Globster. This is a very real and well-documented phenomenon wherein strange masses of flesh wash up on shores worldwide. These chunks of meat are often hairy. There's no single explanation for this phenomenon. The term was coined by Ivan T. Sanderson in 1962 to describe the Tasmanian carcass of 1960, which is said to have no visible eyes, no defined head, and no apparent bone structure. Other examples of globsters include the St. Augustine monster, the Chilean blob, and also the Montauk monster. Hellhound. The concept of hellhounds are born in mythology, Cerberus from Greek mythology is the multi-headed dog who guarded the gates of the underworld, preventing the dead from leaving and making sure that those who entered never left. In some legends, Cerberus has three heads, but in others he has 50 or even 100 heads. In some later myths, Cerberus had three dog heads, the rest of them being the heads of snakes spurting from his back, with the venomous one also serving as his tail. A similar figure appears in Norse mythology, Garmer, or Garm, is a wolf associated with the realm of Hell and Ragnarok, and described as a blood-stained guardian of Hell's Gate. In one of the poems of the Poetic Edda, Garm is said to be to canines what Odin is to gods and what Yggdrasil is to trees, the greatest of its kind. There are also many recorded sightings of black dogs, which seem paranormal and extraordinary. There are legends of giant, devilish hounds that were said to haunt Britain's villages and countryside, bringing doom, tragedy, and death in their spectral and demonic wake. They are usually much larger than normal dogs and said to possess a pair of large, glowing eyes, often red. They are also accompanied by the smell of sulfur or burning brimstone. They are said to frequent graveyards, old roadways, crossroads, and bridges and are almost unanimously associated with the realm of the dead. It was believed that if one of these black dogs was seen, it meant that a tragedy would soon unfold. These creatures were said to be anything from the ghosts of dead travelers to spirits of dead hounds awaiting the return of their masters, forbidden knowledge to being the devil himself. France, AD 856. A black hound was said to materialize in a church, even though the doors were shut. The church grew dark as it padded up and down the aisle, as if looking for someone. The dog then vanished, 
as suddenly as it had appeared. The most recent sightings of hillhounds that I could find occurred in Connecticut, Kentucky, Louisiana, Ohio, as well as Vilsack, Germany, often in or near cemeteries. Given this creature appearing across mythologies and legends, one must wonder if there is something more to this tale. An interesting modern encounter with a hellhound took place in Romulus, Michigan. A witness, identifying as S. Costilla, was living with his family in a cabin on a farm surrounded by a dense forest. Quote, We had this really strange dog, or creature, that would hang around the property. I say dog creature because this thing was far too big and intelligent to be a stray dog. It had very pronounced red eyes. I'm not saying it was a werewolf or a dog man, but it was very werewolf-like. The dog would frequently stalk the edge of the woods on our property in the day. It seemed to have no fear. My uncle would yell at it or throw things towards it to try to scare it off, but it would simply rear up on its hind legs like a ram and charge at him for a short distance. We would frequently find dead chickens or rabbits after thunderstorms. We knew it was the dog thing because it would leave huge paw prints in the mud and claw marks on the window ledges. Sometimes we would find the screens ripped from our screen doors and our windows. It would never outright attack us, but it did seem to enjoy taunting us and harassing us. One summer night, my mom had left the window open in my bedroom to cool the room off so I could sleep. She was on her way to the bathroom and went by my room and heard me talking to someone. When she opened the door, she saw me standing in my bed, and I had apparently wet my pajamas. I was talking towards the window. I wasn't screaming or freaking out, but seemed to be transfixed and talking in a low voice towards the window. When she looked towards the window, the dog had his two front paws pushed through the screen and was looking through the window at us and making a low growl. Its eyes glared red. I always recall its eyes. You could see its eyes out in the woods sometimes at night. I still have bad dreams about it from time to time. Over the next few weeks, the witness allegedly displayed odd behavior, and the house pets would not go near him. He would also blurt out cryptic messages such as, We don't want you here. Our ghosts are food or God thinks you're bad, and would sometimes intentionally prick himself with sharp objects until he drew blood. This saga of high strangeness ended when the witness's uncle fired upon the creature, striking it in the rear. The witness's family was left alone by the entity after this, and the witness himself went back to normal. The Loveland Frogman. Again, for this case, I have to give you some context first. 1955 was a year of strange encounters, and this one is definitely weird. The story of the Loveland Frogman is often misunderstood, and details are warped or omitted by retellings and even media organizations like Snopes. But I've dug up the most accurate information from interviews with Frank Whitecotton, Chief Coordinator for Civil Defense in Cincinnati, Police Chief Fritz, and the witness himself, conducted by paranormal investigator and ufologist Leonard Stringfield. Stringfield became interested in the case after hearing unconfirmed reports of FBI involvement. After meeting with White Cotton, he then connected Stringfield with Police Chief Fritz. According to the police chief, the incident occurred one evening early in July 1955, or possibly late in June. The witness was a 19-year-old volunteer policeman named C.F. Note that the media's coverage of this and later retellings would wrongly describe the witness as a prominent businessman. C.F. was driving his civil defense truck over the only bridge into Loveland when he noticed a terrible smell hanging over the area. He then noticed movement and looked to see four small figures moving oddly on the riverbank beneath the bridge. CF immediately drove to police headquarters in Loveland and reported the incident. When Fritz was asked about the FBI's involvement, he denied it but began acting uncharacteristically nervous. Chief Fritz even tried to change the subject after this question. When the original witness was interviewed, he initially didn't want to discuss the incident with anyone at any time at all. CF said that he was ridiculed for his experience, 
and was even forced to quit his job with the civil defense because of the harassment. Because of this, CF was very bitter, but finally divulged some information. CF stated that he saw four more or less human-looking little men, about three feet high, and that they had been moving about oddly under the bridge, and that there had been a terrible smell about the place. He had only seen them for about ten seconds. Their most distinguishing characteristic being their frog-like heads, which apparently bore deep wrinkles where their hair should have been. Allegedly, CF's story was printed in the local newspaper, but the original newspaper has never been found, and since we don't have the original newspaper article, there's no way to know if he gave more details to newspapers initially, which could be where the other details repeated in later retellings comes from. In 1972, two police officers would see the Frogman. On March 3rd, 1972, at 1 a.m., Loveland police officer Ray Shockey was patrolling near the Little Miami River. The officer was driving slowly due to ice on the roads when he saw what looked like a dog by the curb. The unidentified animal scurried across the road in front of his vehicle. Suddenly, the officer slammed on the brakes in order to prevent slamming into the creature. The cruiser slid and came to a halt, and its headlights fell upon the prone animal. It was fully illuminated in his vehicle's headlights, and he described it as three to four feet long and about 50 to 75 pounds with leathery skin and a frog or lizard-like face. In the span of seconds, Officer Shockey stated that the animal crouched like a frog, stood on two legs, and stared back at the policeman then scrambled over the guardrail and scurried down the embankment into the Little Miami River. Officer Shockey's sister drew this sketch of the creature from her brother's testimony. The second officer, Officer Matthews, investigated the scene later that evening. He saw no sign of the creature, but reported that there were distinct scratch marks on the guardrail where the animal purportedly crossed. On March 17th, Officer Matthews was driving outside of Loveland when he saw what he thought was roadkill. He stopped his car to remove the carcass from the road when the creature stood up and got into a crouched position. It was the same creature, the frogman. It hobbled over to the guardrail, and Officer Matthews fired at the creature, but he seemed to have missed as the creature didn't slow down at all. This is the officer's original story, and they both agreed that the sketch was the creature that they saw. A farmer in Loveland also saw the creature during the same month as the two police officers. The two officers, like CF before them, both faced ridicule and humiliation for their encounters. In 2016, a photo surfaced of an alleged frogman, but in the end, this was an admitted hoax. Following the fake sighting, Officer Matthews called a news station to report that he had actually shot and killed the creature weeks after the original 1972 incident, and had identified it as merely a large iguana that was missing its tail. If this was the case, why did he change his original story from the creature escaping? And why did the two men agree that the sketch of the frogman was an accurate depiction of the creature they both saw? Fortean investigator Ron Schaffner, who looked into this case, and interviewed both Officer Matthew and Officer Shockey, believes that the two were going back on their original story to divert attention away from themselves. Quote, Why, after all these years, is Matthews debunking the story? I'm not sure. Could be a number of reasons. But both officers told us that it resembled the sketch in 1976. Why would they show us a composite drawing of this creature back in 1976 and tell us that it looked like the drawing? Just maybe, Matthews is tired of hearing the story and all the variations." End quote. Why was Chief Fritz unwilling to discuss the case when he spoke openly of other cases even more bizarre, such as the Branch Hill encounter, and other strange reports of, quote, "...smelly little men in Loveland"? Was the FBI ever involved in this case, and if so, why? Was this creature really just a large iguana, or something alien? Reptilians. Legends of reptilians have existed for thousands of years. 
Archaeologists have unearthed 7,000-year-old humanoid lizard statues from Mesopotamia, and the Hindu Vedic scriptures depict the Naga as shape-shifting lizards. Many people report being abducted by UFOs and encountering reptilian beings aboard the crafts. Theories range from the reptilians coming from the Alpha Draconis star system and or living in caverns or deep underground military bases here on Earth. Another theory is that the reptilians have the power to shapeshift and take the form of humans, disguising themselves to blend in with the elite political class and control our world. Personally, I've always felt that this theory is a way to cope with how cruel and psychopathic certain politicians, bankers, and world leaders can be. I'm kind of keeping this one short because I'm going to be doing an alien or UFOlogy iceberg, and we're going to talk a lot more about reptilians there. Yowie. The Yowie seems to be another regional variant of the Sasquatch, native to Australia. However, there are some key differences in the reports. The Yowie is said to be taller than the North American Bigfoot on average, between 9 and 12 feet tall. It is also said to have red or brown fur and claws on its hands and feet. It is also noted that the Yowie has two large fang-like canines and a wide flat nose, which can distinguish the Yowie from other Bigfoot species. The most prominent difference between the Yowie and the Bigfoot is in the Yowie's behavior and aggression. The first accounts of the Yowie come from the oral history of the aboriginals who first inhabited Australia. The aboriginals even created statues of the Yowie, some of which can be seen on screen now. To me, the fact that the aboriginals had legends of such a creature long before westerners arrived, who would then also witness the creature, lends this a little more credence. The first European encounter took place in 1882, and sightings continue to this day. While researching the Yowie, the best resource I found was the Yowie Hunters website, which contains numerous newspaper clippings, eyewitness sketches, and sightings of the Yowie. Here you can see a map of Yowie sightings. It is primarily seen around Australia's eastern states. However, the most famous piece of Yowie evidence, the Australian counterpart to the Patterson-Gimlin film, is the Piper footage, which you're seeing on screen now. In terms of behavior, the Yowie is said to be far more aggressive than the North American Sasquatch. Some researchers believe that the Yowie is responsible for particularly strange missing persons cases in Australia. One of these researchers is Dean Harrison, co-founder of the Yowie Research Group. Harrison claims he was nearly killed twice by Yowies, and has also been quoted as saying, There are a lot of people who go missing in the bush and the cases remain unsolved, and it is usually put down to homicide. Be but I think some of these are the work of Yowies." End quote. And, according to Harrison, there are similar legends of Yowie abductions told by the Aboriginals. Harrison has investigated reports by everyone from Aboriginals to federal agents, and believes that some tentacle of the Australian government is studying and researching the Yowie. Harrison states that he was in contact with people stationed at the Canungra Army Base in 1998. When security was doing their usual checks around the base, they found the door of the mess hall unlocked and ajar. As they drew near, the soldiers heard the sounds of pots and pans clanging together. The men crept inside and found a large, bipedal, great ape going through the kitchen. The soldiers ran out, closed the doors behind them, and locked the creature inside. They called for their superiors, federal agents who came, and were able to put some sort of tracking device the size of a 50 cent piece between the Yowie's shoulder blades before releasing it back into the wild, and that they've been tracking it ever since. Harrison also recounted a tale of how the body of a Yowie was discovered by a young aboriginal boy in the year 2000. The body was reportedly found lying face down in a creek. Quote, I've spoken to the witness, and they said that some unknown federal group came up from Sydney and transferred the body. Not a word was said since. They phoned the police station and asked what happened, and they said that they knew nothing. It's theorized that a creature like the Yowie, 
much like the other Sasquatch-type beings, could be the descendant of Gigantopithecus, a massive, extinct great ape, or perhaps something similar. Another hypothesis is that the Yaoi could be some kind of living Homo erectus, the presence of which in prehistoric Australia is suspected but not proven. Like the Bigfoot, there are more esoteric explanations for the Yaoi as well. Some encounters with the creature are said to leave a strange electric phenomena behind, suggesting that this could be more than just a flesh and blood ape. The aboriginals have said that the Yaoi is most likely to be seen during a storm, when the electric charge of lightning may be present. The Du Lugal, as tribes in northeastern Victoria have called the Yaoi, is said to live in another dimension, which echoes Native American lore about the Sasquatch. Is it possible that an Australian ape could exist and evade capture for so long? Or is the Yaoi a more mystical and ethereal being from another plane of reality? And if so, what does it want with us? Dragon. Mythical creatures, which are essentially giant flying lizards that can breathe fire. All cultures from east to west have legends of dragons. In eastern mythos, dragons are benevolent, more serpentine beings and can fly without the use of wings. However, in the west, dragons are more malevolent and have a taste for eating humans and terrorizing countrysides by breathing fire. The Peluda appeared in the Middle Ages in France. The beast was a gigantic, dragon-like creature, but instead of being covered entirely in scales, it had long green fur on its torso and a tuft of sharp, venomous quills on its back. The French sources tell us that the beast was serpent-headed and serpent-tailed, ox-sized with an egg-shaped body, and that the creature had broad, tortoise-like feet. Like most dragons, the Peluda was capable of breathing fire and threatened the French by murdering people and livestock burning crops by breathing fire, as well as ruining crops by causing floods merely by entering a nearby river. One man's fiance was eaten by the Peluda, and he set off for revenge. He learned that the beast's tail was its weak point, and managed to slay the dragon. Anthropologist David E. Jones argues that belief in dragons is so widespread among ancient cultures because evolution embedded an innate fear of predators in the human mind, particularly for reptiles and serpents. It's possible that these universal fears have been combined in both folklore and mythology to create the myth of the dragon. A study found that approximately 39 people in 100 are afraid of snakes, and also notes that the fear of snakes is especially prominent in children even in areas where snakes are rare. The earliest attested dragons all resemble snakes or have snake-like attributes. Jones therefore concludes that dragons appear in nearly all cultures because humans have an innate fear of snakes and other reptiles that were major predators of our primate ancestors. Dragons are usually said to reside in dank caves, deep pools, wild, mountainous reaches, sea bottoms, and haunted forests. All places which would have been fraught with danger for early human ancestors. The Hydra, a many-headed dragon-like monster which lurked in the Lake of Lerna, an alleged entrance to the underworld. In the canonical Hydra myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, or Hercules, as the second of his twelve labors. The Hydra was capable of regeneration and healing. The demigod Heracles fought and killed the monster by cutting off its heads and one by one burning the bloodied stumps to prevent the heads from regenerating. The Hydra had other parallels in ancient Near Eastern religions, such as the Sumerian, Babylonian, and Assyrian mythology, which celebrated the deeds of the war and hunting god Ninurta, credited with slaying 11 monsters on an expedition to the mountains, including a seven-headed serpent, as well as the Bashmu, whose constellation, despite having a single head, was later associated by the Greeks with the Hydra. Skinwalker To the Navajo, the Skinwalker is a type of harmful witch who has the ability to turn into, possess, or disguise themselves as an animal. The Navajo believe that there are places where the powers of both good and evil are present, and that those powers can be harnessed for either one. Medicine men utilize these powers to heal and aid members of their communities, while those who practice Navajo witchcraft seek to direct the spiritual forces 
to cause harm or misfortune to others. This type of Navajo witchcraft is known as the witchery way, which uses human corpses in various ways such as tools from the bones and concoctions that are used to curse, harm, or kill victims. In order to practice their good works, traditional healers learn about both good and evil magic. Most can handle the responsibility, but some people can become corrupt and choose to become witches. These evil witches are said to form secret societies, which gather in dark caves or secluded places to initiate new members, plot their activities, harm people from a distance with black magic, and perform dark ceremonial rites. During these gatherings, the skinwalkers shapeshift into their animal forms or wear only beaded jewelry and ceremonial paint. The leader of the skinwalkers is said to usually be an old man who is a very powerful and long-lived skinwalker. In order to become a skinwalker, one must be initiated by this secret society requiring the evilest of deeds, the killing of a close family member, most often a sibling. After this task has been completed, the individual then receives supernatural powers. This gives them the ability to shapeshift into animals. Most often, they are seen in the form of coyotes, wolves, foxes, cougars, dogs, and bears, but they can take the form of any animal. They then wear the skins of the animal they transform into, hence the name Skinwalker. Sometimes, they would wear animal skulls or antlers atop their heads, which is said to bring them more power. They're said to be able to run faster than a car and have the ability to jump high cliffs. They can control animals, possess bodies of human victims if a person looks them in the eyes, and after taking control, the witch can make its victims do and say things that they wouldn't otherwise. One way that it's said you can tell a skinwalker apart from a real animal is their eyes. Their eyes are very human-like, but when lights are shined on them, they turn bright red. Alternatively, when they're in human form, their eyes look more animal-like. Skinwalker Ranch is a paranormal hotspot and one of the most famous locations prone to high strangeness. The land was said to have been cursed by the Navajo long ago. It is said that the Skinwalker roams the area of the ranch, and the Navajo do not go there even to this day. The U.S. government has spent billions of dollars researching the wide variety of paranormal phenomena there. Among the oddities of Skinwalker Ranch, there are sightings of Bigfoots, Dogmen, Orbs, Strange Lights, Cattle Mutilations, and many UFO sightings. Lon Strickler of Phantoms and Monsters received this account of a recent possible Skinwalker sighting on Highway I-191 near Skinwalker Ranch. Quote, my friend drove a tractor trailer for a few years a while back. He told me he was driving a rig very late at night in northeast Utah on a lesser used two-lane highway. He said he remembers feeling very alert that night, so he noticed what appeared to be a figure manifesting up ahead on the dark road. He told me it wasn't on the road but just next to it. He then comes to a stop and grabs his heavy-duty flashlight and points it at the figure. According to the witness, this humanoid creature was feeding on a dead coyote while crouching. The truck had grabbed its attention and pissed it off, so it sort of stands up so he can get a full view of the truck. It was giant, pale, hairless, with very big eyes, and of course, the coyote blood all over its face. Its height was over six feet, and it had skinny limbs and no clothing. He then describes how it started to shuffle slowly towards the truck. Not only does he not have a weapon at the time, all he had was the long flashlight that he's using to view the creature. He decides to book it, hit the gas, and leave. He had no problem passing it. He looked in his mirror to see the creature standing in the middle of the road on two legs as he drove away. He came to a stop at a nearby truck stop where he allegedly met with two other men, other truckers, who also saw the creature and were shaken up. The Fresno Nightcrawler. The Fresno Nightcrawler is a bizarre cryptid which looks like a pair of disembodied legs, very thin, and with gray or white skin. In some sightings, the creature is said to walk with strange backwards knees, with some kind of webbing connecting the knees to the upper body. According to the Fresno Bee, the first sighting of these beings were captured by a man named Jose in 2007. 
Jose observed the night crawlers on his front lawn through CCTV. He woke up his brother to rewatch the footage. After this, his brother claimed to have seen small footprints outside, but by the time investigators made it to the site, all evidence was washed away. Jose brought the footage to Univision, hoping to find answers, but was left unsated. The original CCTV footage has since been lost, and now all that remains is the recording of the monitor the footage was playing on. In the second episode of Sci-Fi's Fact or Faked, Paranormal Files, the team attempted to recreate the video to see how it could have been faked. They tried using a combination of pants on a string, but this recreation didn't match the original. They eventually deemed the Nightcrawler unexplainable because they failed to recreate Jose's footage in any convincing way. In Yosemite National Park, footage was taken from another security camera. This time, there are two creatures, one being very small. You can also clearly see the feet of these creatures, as well as what appears to be some sort of webbing connecting the knees to the upper body. We also have to talk about the 2014 Carmel Area creature. The witness, a 60-year-old ex-marine yet to be named, and his wife were driving near Carmel on December 12, 2014, when they came up over a hill and saw a creature, seven feet tall, slender, and gray, which is now known as the Carmel Area creature. The witness said the following, quote, We recently bought a place in the Fort Hill area in southeast Highland County. We first noticed, after about 30 days of living here, that we suddenly had a perfect circle that stays fresh green no matter what weather in our front yard. On Friday night, the 12th, we were driving home. After turning on Carmel Road, which leads to our road, we went around the curve by the Carmel Church and then up a small incline and approximately 10 feet over the incline and in front of our truck, the alien ran across the road and into the woods. On screen now, you can see the eyewitness sketch of the creature. April 25th, 2020, in Billings, Montana, the night crawler was seemingly captured on security camera footage again. This video also has audio, and it seems that the night crawler can be heard making pig-like sounds. The next day, a deer carcass was found close to the area where the video was captured. Though it's a bit of a stretch, and the creature has never been observed displaying aggressive behavior, this deer could be a victim of the night crawler. While there have been claims that the night crawler is part of certain Native American legends, this has been debunked. Other videos of the creature have been proven as hoaxes, including a video of an encounter from Poland. There are different theories as to what the night crawlers are, or if they're even real or not. Some believe that they could be an undocumented species of primate, which I think is very unlikely, or that these could be a strange race of extraterrestrials. Centaur, another creature from Greco-Roman mythology. Centaurs are a horse-human hybrid, with the head and neck of a horse being replaced by the upper body of a human. Centaurs are very powerful and make deadly warriors. The most notable centaur was Chiron, who trained many of the Greco-Roman demigods and heroes of legend such as Heracles and Achilles. Surprisingly, there have actually been sightings of centaurs in the modern era as well. In North America specifically, there have been a multitude of these sightings, mostly by Native Americans. The following is another account forwarded to Lon Strickler's Phantoms and Monsters. And by the way, if you're interested in this stuff and you've never looked at Phantoms and Monsters, I definitely recommend you do so. When my father's friend was younger, he was a deputy for the Apache Reservation Police. I believe it happened in the early 1980s, but not sure. One night, he was on patrol in his squad car, alone on the reservation. He was driving along the deserted highway that passed through town. When he reached the church, he saw something moving back and forth, peering into the windows of the church. He stopped the car on the highway and observed for a little while. It was too dark to make out much at first. Then, the creature noticed him and began moving out of the shadows and into the front of the church. The creature came into the headlights of the police car, finally illuminating what he had been watching. The being was described as an eight foot tall demon centaur. The bottom half was indeed a dark haired horse, while where the neck and head should have been was the upper torso of a man. The man was staring right at him as it strolled by, all four hooves clanking on the pavement, and it had horns on either side of his head. He said they were like ram horns, curled around on either side of his skull. He was terrified, and while he thought of shooting the beast, he reasoned against it. He didn't want to provoke it and have it attack him. 
it completed crossing the road and down a steep slope into a farmland below. Once it reached this open ground, he watched as it started to run away as fast as possible until it disappeared into the darkness and trees beyond. He was deeply troubled after the encounter and couldn't reason why such a demonic creature would be looking into a building as holy as a church. The way he told the story, you couldn't help but believe it to be true, and I'm sure that it actually happened." End quote. Here is the eyewitness sketch of the creature. This is only one of several cases of centaur sightings I've been able to find. Is it possible that a creature from Greek mythology could walk the earth even today? Gargoyle. Gargoyle has the same root word as gargle because gargoyles channel water out of their mouths to prevent rainwater from simply running down the walls of buildings and ruining the masonry. But other than just being architectural structures, they were believed in mythology to frighten away evil spirits. But the idea of these statues physically coming to life is a more recent idea. Like golems, which we're going to talk about later, gargoyles are usually made of magically animated or transformed stone, but have animal or chimera traits and are often guardians of a place such as a cathedral or a castle. They can also be depicted as vessels for demonic possession or as a living species resembling statues. Even to this day, there are actually a lot of reports of winged humanoids or bat-like creatures being spotted in the skies of Earth. There have been recent reports of a being described as a gargoyle in Florida from 2017 to 2018 and onward. Again, this is another report from Phantoms and Monsters. Quote, two weeks ago, I had the night off. So another guy I work with took my route. In case you don't know, Brooksville, Florida and Zephyr Hills, Florida are both riddled with dark roads with no street lights and just trees to the left and right side of the road. Apparently, when he was driving between his third and fourth stop near Zephyr Hills on Route 98 at about 3.30 p.m., he said he saw this thing floating stationary about 15 feet off the ground next to a tree. As he got closer, he realized it looked like a dark-colored humanoid in a cannonball position, just floating in the air, like frozen. He said by the time he asked himself, what the fuck is that, the creature unraveled itself, and it spread out its legs and giant bat-like wings. He didn't know what color the creature was, but he said it was definitely a dark color, and it had human-like legs. At the same moment, it spread its wings and legs and flew towards his truck at an unrealistic speed like a fighter jet. He said he almost crashed the truck in the ditch because it basically paralyzed him with fear. He said it happened so fast he didn't get a look at the face, but he said it was probably between 5 and 6 feet tall, dark colored, and it had human legs with bat wings. He also said that about a half a mile before he saw the creature, he saw a bunch of dead deer on the side of the road, like piles of deer, two separate piles of at least four deer. He assumes it was eating them. The witness is a pretty soft-spoken dude and intelligent. The way he tells the story, I can tell it really freaked him out." End quote. This is only one of many modern reports of flying humanoids. Lon Strickler has been keeping up with these reports and has even launched the Winged Humanoid Project to collect these anomalous reports. It makes you wonder if such creatures could truly be stalking the skies and what their true nature really is. Gnomes. In European folklore, gnomes are dwarfish, subterranean goblin or earth spirits who guard mines of precious treasures hidden within the earth. They're represented in medieval mythologies as a small, physically deformed, usually hunchbacked creature resembling a dry, gnarled old man. Gob, the king of the gnome race, was said to rule with a magic sword and is said to have influenced the melancholic temperament of man. The term gnome was popularized through the works of the 16th century Swiss alchemist Paracelsus, in which gnomes were described as diminutive figures, two spans in height, who did not like to mix with humans. They are said to be capable of moving through solid earth as fish move through water. Despite being a common staple of fantasy and mythology, sightings of dwarves and gnomes persist to the modern era. There are actually a lot of these sightings, more than you would probably think. 
there has even been a mass sighting of gnomes. We have a video of an alleged gnome encounter from Argentina, 2008, in the province of Salta. Quote, We were chatting about our last fishing trip. It was one in the morning. I began to film a bit with my mobile phone. All the others were chatting and joking. Suddenly we heard something, a weird noise as if someone was throwing stones. We looked to one side and saw that the grass was moving. To begin with, we thought it was a dog. But when we saw this gnome-like figure began to emerge, we were really afraid. This is no joke. We are still afraid to go out, just like everyone in the neighborhood is now. One of my friends was so scared after seeing that thing that we had to take him to the hospital." End quote. While researching this, I came across many reports of similar sightings of gnomes and other entities. In Detroit, of all places, there are many gnome sightings, which date back to pre-colonial times from the Native Americans. Sightings of these creatures tie back to the concepts of the Fae and an unseen supernatural world or dimension that exists alongside ours, giants. There are legends from every culture and every faith of gigantic humans. However, some believe that these giants are much more than myth. President Abraham Lincoln believed in giants, and it seems that it was just taken for granted that a race of giants had once lived in North America. Quote, the eyes of that species of extinct giant whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. End quote. There are numerous old newspaper articles that tell of giant skeletons being unearthed in North America and in other locations. These giant skeletons were alleged to have a unique trait, a double row of teeth, though these could be cases of yellow journalism. There are other cases of explorers encountering people of giant proportions, living giants. A prominent example of this is the Patagonia giants. They were said to have exceeded at least double normal human height, with some accounts giving heights of 12 to 15 feet tall or more. Tales of these people would maintain a hold upon European conceptions of the region for some 250 years. The first mention of these people came from the voyage of Ferdinand Magellan and his crew, who claimed to have seen them while exploring the coastline of South America en route to the Maluku Islands and their circumnavigation of the world in the 1520s. One of the officers wrote in his account about their encounter with natives twice the height of a normal person. Quote, One day, we suddenly saw a naked man of giant stature on the shore of the port, dancing, singing, and throwing dust on his head. Captain Magellan sent one of our men to the giant so that he might perform the same actions as a sign of peace. Having done that, the man led the giant to an islet where the Captain General was waiting. When the giant was in the Captain General's and our presence, he marveled greatly and made signs with one finger raised upward, believing that we had come from the sky. He was so tall that we reached only to his waist and he was well proportioned." End quote. In 1579, Francis Drake's ship captain wrote about meeting a very tall Patagonian of seven and a half feet tall. And in the 1590s, it was claimed that dead bodies 12 feet long were found in Patagonia. The giant of Castle Now refers to three bone fragments, a humerus, tibia, and a femoral mid-shaft, discovered in 1890 in the sediments used to cover a Bronze Age burial site. These fossilized bones may belong to one of the largest humans ever known to have existed. It was estimated that from the bone size, this person may have been 11 feet tall. Apparently, these bone fragments of what would be the tallest person in history were lost 100 years ago, and this ties into the conspiracy theory that the skeletons and relics of these giants are being hidden and suppressed by the Smithsonian and other archaeological institutions for nefarious purposes. The square cube law tells us that a human-like giant of extreme proportions couldn't exist because as size increases, so does weight. And doubling height can result in weight being multiplied, meaning that a giant of sufficient size should have his bones snap from merely walking, not to mention possible organ system issues from this vast size. Despite this, giants appear in most world religions and in the folklore of countries around the world. You have the Nephilim from Abrahamic or Judeo-Christian faith, 
The Greeks and Romans had their legends of giants. The Native Americans had their red-haired giants. And there's also the giant of Kandahar. The last two we'll get into on later levels of the iceberg.